audio diary account is my interpretation of the chronological story behind each user of the audio diary. It is not factual. I believe that the audio diaries were written in a way so there would be multiple valid ways of interpreting them. How's it going everyone? I'm Town Cape and today I'm going to present the audio diary account of Bill McDonagh. We all know that eventually McDonagh was going to lose his life at Ryan's hands. But before that, they had a great friendship. I go as far as to suggest that he and Ryan were even best friends. So how did their friendship begin? What tore it apart? That's what we'll find out today. McDonagh was one of the first people to come down to Rapture. He was a full-fledged objectivist, but he wasn't an extremist. He was loyal to the philosophy, but stayed within its limits. As Ryan's general contractor, he's one of his most trusted followers. That's why Ryan granted him the opportunity to join the city council. From the beginning, McDonagh loved Rapture and wanted it to thrive. Ryan really made it into the city that any loyal objectivist would dream of. McDonagh even set up his own tavern, the Fighting McDonagh there, where he would often allow Ryan and his mistress to visit during their dates. However, life in Rapture took a turn for the worse when Fontaine Futuristics began rising in power. McDonagh wasn't as disconnected from the poor people of Rapture as Ryan was. He owned a tavern that hosted all kinds of people, rich and poor. That's why you notice how much influence Fontaine's genetic modification market was having on the many poor people on Rapture. But that wasn't all McDonagh noticed. He also noticed that his best friend Ryan was pretty ignorant of Fontaine's increasing influence. He heard of how he didn't even bother listening to one of his employees when he went to warn him about Fontaine. Ryan's ignorance troubled McDonagh, and one of his employees at the tavern noticed. They wanted to know what was bothering him. However, this wasn't a question that McDonagh could answer at any time or any place, so he left an audio diary at a private location to address their concerns. Rapture's changing, but Ryan can't see the wolves in the woods. He's Fontaine fella. He's a crook and a proper tea leaf, but he's got the Adam, and that makes him the governor. He's sinking the profits back into bigger and better plasmids, building them Fontaine poor houses, <laughs> like Fontaine recruiting centers. For we know it, those gonna have a, an army of splicers. <laughs> We're gonna have ourselves a whole heap of miseries. It's quite clear that McDonagh was more intuitive than Ryan. Even before Ryan had begun to see Fontaine as a competitor in the market, McDonagh could see what Fontaine's end goal was. However, McDonagh didn't have much time to worry about Fontaine because his worries were soon seized by another resident of Rapture. Steinman was a brilliant plastic surgeon that was in charge of the medical pavilion in Rapture. He was a member of the high class society of Rapture, but he wasn't that close to Ryan. That's why Ryan's rival Fontaine didn't mind consulting him on the effects of Adam. Initially, Adam was just something popular among the low-class society of Rapture. It wasn't really until Ryan had nationalized Fontaine Futuristics that the high-class society of Rapture started showing great interest in Adam. Since Steinman was on good terms with Fontaine, he was one of the first high-class members who knew about Adam. It started as an interest, but eventually Steinman began taking a few doses of Adam as well. This made him lose some of his organizational skills. Eventually, he would be driven insane, but at this point in the story, he was still a brilliant plastic surgeon who had begun to go on a bit of a tilt. He began to neglect taking care of medical pavilion, and this brought him into conflict with McDonagh, who was also working as a plumber. McDonagh arranged to have a meeting with Steinman on the state of medical pavilion, but Steinman was too busy going on insane, so he didn't bother turning up. McDonagh decided to leave him an audio diary addressing his concerns. Steinman, I know medical pavilion is your manner, but you might want to cogitate on this. Ocean water is colder than a witch's tip. You don't heat the pipes, the pipes freeze. Pipes freeze, pipes burst then rapture leaks. Now, I realize you're a posh sort of geezer, and frankly, I don't give a toss if you piss or go fishing. But once rapture starts leaking, the old girl's never gonna stop. And then I'll be sure to tell Ryan he's got you a thank. However, this wasn't the end of McDonagh's leaking problems. It wasn't long to learn that there were other leaks springing up in Rapture. McDonagh decided to inform all the other plumbers via audio diaries, which were sent from Jet Postal. Things weren't bad enough. 
It seems that even our water system sprung a leak. Yep, that's right. Irrigation system in Arcadia is taking on seawater. I told Mr. Ryan when we were building this place, either you build her like a bathtub, or she's gonna turn into a sewer. No, McDonough, he said. We're not gonna build no bathtub. We're gonna build Eden. McDonough knows that it's Ryan's overconfidence that led to Rapture not being as leak-proof as it could have been, and that really infuriated him. Normally, he wouldn't talk badly about Ryan in such an open way, but since he let his temper get the better of him, he wasn't afraid of saying what he said to his employees. While McDonagh was a high class of a member of society, it's clear that he always kept close relations with his employees, and they got to see his joy and his rage. McDonagh's employees always knew that he and Ryan were best friends, but now, they also knew that it was Ryan's fault that McDonagh's work wasn't as great as it could have been. This caused him to wonder how McDonagh and Ryan could even be best friends. What if his employees decided to ask McDonagh himself? McDonagh was busy at that time and couldn't engage in lengthy discussions, so he decided to leave an audio diary for his employee in the fighting McDonagh. I met Ryan the day me and the lads were installing the bathroom plumbing up in his Posh Park Avenue digs. Oi, says he, what's with all the brass fittings? General contractor had me down for the tip. Well, I says, I suppose it's the contractor then who'll be bailing out your loot once a fortnight, is it? If it's a price you're worried about, I'll be picking up the brass, so not to worry, Squire. Then why would you be doing that, says he? Well, Mr. Ryan, profit or not, no man bells water out of previous built by Bill McDonough. Next day, I find out I'm Ryan's new general contractor. After McDonagh's employee had heard this diary, he understood why his boss and Andrew Ryan were such good friends. Ryan burnt down his own park just to keep it out of government hands, while McDonagh was willing to sacrifice his own money to keep his pipes in check. They were both perfection in this, so they could easily relate to one another. The only difference between the two is that McDonagh was very good at estimating his capabilities, while Ryan wasn't. Ryan suffered from overconfidence and had a bit of an inflated ego. This is what caused Ryan to overlook McDonagh's concerns over the pipes in Arcadia, not being as strong as they could have been. Ryan was a businessman and was more concerned with the appearance of the product rather than its intrinsic value. When the pipes in Arcadia finally leaked, Ryan effectively ruined McDonagh's no pipe leak record, and this really upset McDonagh. He was still Ryan's best friend, but their friendship wasn't as strong as it used to be. That's what pipes leaking represents in McDonagh's story. Pipes leaking is a symbol for the cracking relationship between Ryan and McDonagh. It wouldn't be long until their friendship would shatter entirely, but first McDonagh and Ryan had to deal with Fontaine. Eventually, Ryan realized what a strong competitor Fontaine really was, and this put him in a really worried state. Ryan wanted to remain the number one businessman in Rapture no matter what. However, he had been ignorant of Adam for a long time, while Fontaine had only used it to monopolize his power. Ryan feared that he wouldn't be long until he would no longer be at the top of the great chain of Rapture. However, one day, fortune swung in his favor. Ryan obtained evidence that Fontaine was a smuggler. Ryan could convict him and eliminate his prime competitor in the market. Ryan was so elated by this fact, but McDonagh was it. McDonagh knew his friend inside out. He knew how much Ryan wanted to remain at the top of the great chain of rapture. He suspected that Ryan wouldn't want to just give away the genetic modification market after seeing how much influence it had. He suspected that Ryan may decide to grab Fontaine's business interest for his own gain once he was done with Fontaine. One night when Ryan was spending his time in the fighting McDonagh, he received an audio diary from his friend Bill McDonagh. It was a message about what Bill McDonagh believed Ryan should do after eliminating Fontaine. Mr. Ryan, I believe in Rapture, but that doesn't mean we always win. Fontaine Futuristics is the biggest thing going in Rapture, so let me be plain. When we arrest that towrag Fontaine for his thieving and smuggling, we must make it clear that we won't touch his business interests. We sit on the council because these poor sods trust us, not because God gave us a chair. McDonagh was so committed to convincing Ryan that he even plagued Ryan's ideals. 
wind in like religion. So McDonagh described the idea of seizing power to be akin to grabbing a throne granted from God. The diary probably shook Ryan and caused him to seriously consider what he would do with Fontaine futuristics after arresting Fontaine. Finally, the day to arrest Fontaine arrived. McDonagh was present when Sullivan led his forces down to get Fontaine. Fighting broke out, and for the first time in his life, McDonagh got a look at what the splicers could really do. Fontaine had holed himself pretty well with all his splicers. It was clear that it would take Sullivan a couple of days to break past all of Fontaine's defenses. That's why McDonagh decided to leave and return when the combat was over. However, what he saw the splices do really shook him, so he decided to speak of his experiences to one of his associates. Fontaine knew our blokes were coming. We were done over. Them splices come screaming out the woodwork. Burp in fire, spit in ice. Demons out of the Bible they were. I've never seen nothing like it. It wasn't a business he was building. It was an army. It should be noted here that McDonagh's descriptions of the Splicer's power seems incorrect. The only kind of projectile attacks the Splicer's have come from their hands. This is seen from the advertisements of plasmids. McDonagh speaks of how Splicer's burping, fire, and spitting ice. Where is he getting that from? Well, he's making an analogy. McDonagh probably didn't get a good look at the Splicer's, so he's having trouble describing them. Often, when people have trouble describing something, they search for similar information in their past or present. What McDonagh did was look around where he was while he was recording this audio diary. Now check the location of this diary. He's in third prize, a casino. Judging by what you can see in a casino, it's not unlikely that you might find people burping and sometimes even spitting there. That's where McDonagh got his analogy from. Anyway, as the battle between Sullivan and Fontaine raged on, McDonagh began to hear strange rumors about the effects of Adam. Seems like some poor blighters have started seeing ghosts. <laughs> ghosts! Ryan tells me it's a side effect of this plasmid business. One poor sod's memory is getting passed on to another through genetic sampling. Leaks. Lunatics. Rebellion. And now, bleeding ghosts. Life in At the end of this recording, McDonagh lists the problems that he's encountered in Rapture in recent times. By leaks, he's referring to Steinman being neglectful of the medical pavilion. By lunatics, he's referring to the Splicers. And by rebellion, he's referring to Fontaine smugglers. According to Su Chang's audio diaries, there were volunteers on whom plasmids were tested. I believe that in order to create plasmids, they actually needed at least a few human cells. That's where the ghost which McDonagh refers to came from. Of course, this became more common after the Civil War because there was an abundance of human cells then. Anyway, during all this time, Fontaine continued to put up a good fight against Sullivan and his forces. Ryan and McDonagh saw how powerful he really was. The more Ryan saw the power of Fontaine, the more unwilling he looked to just let Fontaine Futuristics be inherited by its next legal owner. That's why McDonagh decided to leave another message for Ryan in Robertson's Tobaccoria. Neither Ryan nor McDonagh ever resorted to the splicing. If they ever wanted to escape their worries, they resorted to the traditional means. They were both regular customers at Robertson's Tobaccoria. They were both on good terms with the owners, and they trusted them to pass their messages along to one another. The good people of Rapture didn't sign up to see us government type shutting down shops, killing their owners. Even with a Ponce like Fontaine. But he brung it upon himself. Instead of copping it on the chin, Bugger gets it into his head that he's gonna go down guns blazing. Who does he think he is? John Bloody White? We can get on top of this. We can. Here's what we do. We find Fontaine's will and make what was his go to where it was intended. And not into the pockets of us that put him into the ground. Not long after McDonagh left his audio diary for Ryan at Roberts's Tobaccoria, Sullivan and his forces finally defeated Fontaine. Now all McDonagh has to do was wait for Ryan to decide what was to become of Fontaine Futuristics. Ryan would make an announcement at the next council meeting. McDonagh hoped his worries had reached Ryan's ears. He hoped that Ryan would attend the council meeting with Fontaine's will. He hoped that he hadn't recorded all those audio dies for nothing. He was wrong. Ryan nationalized Fontaine Futuristics. He owns it now, lock, stock and barrel. For the good of the city, he says. 
He'll break it up in due time, he says. I've resigned from the council and lodged me letter of protest, but that's just pissing in the wind. It'll be war, I say, unless somebody stops Ryan and right fast. McDonough probably hoped that his resignation from the council may convince his friend to stop, but that didn't end up being the case. Ryan seemed to be in denial over what he was doing. He told McDonagh that he had only temporarily nationalized the business, but McDonagh knew him better. McDonagh knew Ryan so well that he basically was the only person to recognize the need to kill Ryan, even before the Civil War began. This marks a sad period in McDonagh's life. He was so distraught that he even began to stop talking to Ryan. Unfortunately for McDonagh, his predictions only continued to come true when the Civil War began. Strikes me that Fontaine wasn't overly inconvenienced by his own demise. On New Year's Eve, these wretched splicers come streaming out of the poorhouses and stormed the proverbial barricades. They're dead rot right in the streets, and Johnny and Janie's citizen are lined up around the block for plasmids. Anything to help fend off the rabble. McDonagh also noticed that plasmid sales had only increased ever since Fontaine's death. It's possible that McDonagh may have suspected that Atlas was Fontaine, but even if he did, it's clear he didn't believe more violence was needed. As the Civil War heated up, McDonagh realized that the things were only going to get worse unless Ryan stepped down. Although it had been a while since McDonagh had spoken to Ryan, he decided to make one final attempt at it trying to reason with him. I begged Mr. Ryan to hand Fontaine's heuristics over to Atlas's boys as a peace offering. But the stupid sod won't listen to reason. Instead, he's just splicing his mob up, giving them more and tougher plasmids. There's an arms race on here in Rapture, but it's not about who can build the best guns and the biggest bombs, it's about who can become less of a man and more of a monster. This audio diary is important because it helps to make a more subtle part of McDonagh more obvious. McDonagh doesn't consider splicers to be human. He describes them as monsters here. Earlier, he described them as demons out of the Bible. Despite their extraordinary abilities, he hasn't made a single positive comment about them. Now this is how you write a friendship. Friends need to have at least some things in common. What Ryan and McDonagh have in common is it but they both have strong beliefs on what it means to be a man. McDonagh doesn't believe the genetic modification market via addictive Adam is an activity that humans should indulge in. And I guess that's because he's an intelligent man and has gotten a first-hand look at the adverse effects of Adams. If you think Andrew Ryan has no strong beliefs on what it means to be a man, then you must be joking. Almost every second sentence Andrew Ryan uses begins with a man does this or a man does that. He clearly has strong beliefs regarding the matter as well. This is what makes their friendship believable. I can actually imagine McDonagh and Ryan sitting in a bar discussing what it means to be a man. I wouldn't necessarily say that the two of them 100% agreed with each other, but I do believe they do, or at least used to, respect each other's opinion. Now Ryan seemed to have lost all faith in McDonagh's beliefs because he's splicing up his own men. I mean, sure. Leaking pipes wasn't that bad, this is a complete disregard for their friendship. By now, it's clear that Andrew Ryan and Bill McDonagh's long friendship is finally over. If you've been paying close attention, you'll notice that I haven't been talking about the location of the previous three audio diaries. That's because they're all located in Hephaestus, the place right next to Raptor Central Command. See the link? I think McDonagh was thinking of killing Ryan for a long time. The way I see it, the more Ryan nationalized Fontaine futuristics, McDonagh knew his friend had gone to the dark side and needed to die. However, he was extremely conflicted on the matter, so he spent time being indecisive at Hephaestus before finally getting the resolve to kill him. Some of the workers in Hephaestus joined McDonagh, but I think there was still a minority who believed that no good would come out of McDonagh's campaign. One of the few workers who were still loyal to Ryan informed him of McDonagh's planned assassination attempt. Initially, Ryan was reluctant to believe that his old friend was planning to kill him. It was true that their friendship had been rocky lately, but Ryan still considered McDonagh his friend. However, the worker claimed that he had proof of McDonagh's treachery. McDonagh had communicated with the other conspirators via audio diaries in order to avoid notice, but this plan backfired when the worker got one of those audio diaries. I never killed a man. 
let alone the mason. But this is what things come to. I don't know if killing Mr. Ryan will stop the war, but I know it won't stop while that man breathes. I love Mr. Ryan, but I love Ratchet. If I have to kill one to save the other, so be it. After hearing this, Ryan was in shock, but he knew he had to get over it. He knew he had to accept that Bill McDonagh was now his enemy. He prepared for the attack, and he ordered his splices to kill not only McDonagh's associates, but McDonagh himself. They succeeded. Ryan disposed of the bodies of McDonagh's associates, but when the time came for him to dispose of McDonagh's body, he found he just couldn't do it. Despite all they had been through, he found that he still had some respect for McDonagh. So he decided to impale McDonagh's corpse on a pillar outside of his office. Before turning away, Ryan left the audio diary that had proven his friend's treachery in his friend's pocket. He believed that there was no better place for it to belong. This began Ryan's tradition of mounting corpses on the pillars outside his office. From this point forth, Whenever an assassin had their eye on his office and Ryan respected the dedication they put into achieving their goal, he ensured that they would have their eyes on his office for all eternity. Anyway, that will be the end of the Audio Diary account of Bill McDonagh. Thank you everyone for watching. Next time I'll be presenting the Audio Diary account of Sullivan. I'll see you guys next time. Have a great day.